Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Gustavo Odrich. I'm one of the vascular surgeons here at the Mayo Clinic. And uh, it's a pleasure this afternoon to give you this webinar on the fenestrated and branched tips and tricks from sizing to implantation. Uh, this was possible uh, and organized by GE Imaging Healthcare. Uh, here are my disclosures. I am a consultant for several of the stent graft companies, as you see listed here, and we do have uh, several research grants. Uh, these are all directed to the Mayo Clinic. I'll also be discussing devices that are investigational or used off-label for other indications. First, uh, I would like to start by uh, with a special thanks to my vascular resident, Dr. Aline Mirza, who assisted with the preparation of a case video presentation that you'll see towards the end of this talk. Also, a special thanks to Ms. Pinar Osbeck from GU Healthcare, who uh, provided us with superb technical support and also assistance with preparation of several of the video clips that you'll see. Mr. David Factor is our illustrator here at the Mayo Clinic. And also thanks to our research team, it's Jen Hofer and Jean Wigan. It always starts uh, with the fact that endovascular aortic repair has dramatically changed the landscape of treatment of aortic aneurysms and dissections. As we all know, there is a number of prospective randomized trials comparing endovascular repair with conventional open surgical repair, and for the most part, these trials demonstrate significant early benefits towards decreased mortality, decreased morbidity, lower blood loss and transfusion requirements, and a faster recovery. Perhaps in no time in the history of vascular surgery and cardiovascular surgery, we experienced such a dr dramatic decline in the mortality of these procedures. In the last decade, there has been over a 30% drop in the relative mortality rate for open repair, for repair of abdominal aortic aneurysms. And currently, in the United States and in most countries worldwide, over 70% of patients are treated by an endovascular approach. And that is not only for aneurysms. There is an overlap with other pathology that is also suitable to treatment with endovascular stents, including trauma, dissections, and acute aortic syndrome. But there are major areas of clinical need where currently approved devices, at least in the United States and in several countries, do not meet the anatomical criteria because of involvement of the ascending aorta or the aortic arch, the renal mesenteric arteries, and the aortoelic arteries. I would like to focus this talk on tips and tricks of fenestrated and branch endovascular repair for treatment of complex aortic aneurysms involving the renal and mesenteric arteries or thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysms. That accounts currently to on 30 to 40 percent of the patients we see in our practice. And that includes patients that have frank aneurysms involving the renal and mesenteric arteries or have a short infrarenal aortic neck or angulation that is really not well suited for an infrarenal repair. As we know, there are several total endovascular alternatives. Perhaps this slide summarizes two of the most frequent alternatives that we see, either parallel stent grafts, also known by a number of different names, including chimney, storco, snorkel, periscope, sandwich grafts, or specifically designed stands, such as fenestrated stands and branched stand grafts. It has been now nearly two decades of the evolution of endovascular repair towards fenestrated and branched repair, and this really started in the west side of Australia with the basic science work of Thomas Brown, Michael Lawrence Brown, and David Hartley in 1997, and then the first clinical implant of this device by John Anderson in Adelaide in 1998. 
This drawing actually is a depiction of the first very case. And if you see, there was a single fenestration to the left renal artery. And the fenestration at the time had struts traveling through the middle of the fenestration and was not reinforced. Since then, the device evolved with a number of pioneers. Some of them actually are joined here in the conference this afternoon, like Dr. Marcelo Ferreira in Rio de Janeiro. The device has evolved, and it was built into a modular component with the fenestrated device proximally and a distal bifurcated device. The fenestration became reinforced. No longer it had struts in the middle. Diameter-reducing ties were added to facilitate the procedure. And these fenestrations became routinely stented, first with bare metal stents and then with covert stents. In addition, a number of other gadgets were added to the device to facilitate the procedure. You see on the illustration the depiction of preloaded renal guide catheters. One of my goals was to start a lab where we would develop technologies that would allow us to go into the branches of the arteries. And people laughed at that. But our first case was 2001. And then that's just kind of blossomed since then. This video was by Roy Greenberg, truly one of the pioneers in these techniques. You may not heard very well, but he was saying that in 2001, when he started designing these stands, People laughed at him, and since then, as you saw, the technique blossomed, and he accumulated the largest number of patients treated for pretty much every single aortic pathology. Now, Roy passed away in 2013, unfortunately, at a very young age. A number of other pioneers, you see here Dr. Tim Schutter, played a critical role in the design and dissemination of these techniques. Dr. Schutter's contribution was the design of directional branches, these pre-sewn cuffs, which evolved, as you see in the illustration, from a homemade multi-branch endograft to a company-made manufactured endograft and then an off-the-shelf device, which is now known as the T-branch endograft. And there is a number of these endografts that are currently either approved or in investigation in several countries. Now, in the United States, on the far left of the slide, you see the Zenith fenestrated stent, which is commercially approved since April of 2012. Cook Medical has really pioneered the technique with development of fenestration branches and composite devices. But a number of other companies are heavily involved. You see here the Anaconda fenestrated, the Jotac device, the Endologix Ventana device, and the WL Gore Tambi device, as well as a prototype of the Metronic Torcoabdominal device. These highlighted devices are currently under the process of investigation or trial design in the United States. Here at Mayo, we have developed a large program because of interactions with industry, and via industry-sponsored trials and physician-sponsored trials, we develop a large platform that allows us early access to these devices. There is a very important learning curve, and that is, I think, the first stepping stone of this talk today. We recently analyzed our experience with 334 consecutive patients treated by fenestrated and branch endografts. First of all, the type of patients have changed over time. You see the experience is divided in quartiles, and if we compare the current era, patients are healthier, slightly younger, and have less comorbidities as compared to the first era. We also are treating more toracoabdominal aneurysms. Nearly every patient we treat nowadays have a patient-specific manufacture device, as opposed to the beginning of the experience where we used physician-modified devices. And also you see the number of fenestration has increased. And despite these more complex anatomy conditions, the volume of contrast and the time for fluoroscopy as recorded here has dramatically decreased over the years. This graph shows a significant reduction in the estimated blood loss over the years. 
and also a reduction in the total operating time, which in this slide counts also time fr from the anesthesia, incision, and the endovascular portion of the procedure. The fluoroscopy time has been reduced, and I think I would like to point out that if you look this from the perspective of a learning curve, we still continue to improve our reduction in radiation, which is an important part of the tips and tricks of this procedure. Same I would say for reduction in contrast. Now, most importantly, the outcomes have become better as one has gained experience. You see here the mortality was reduced from 6% for the entire cohort in the first quartile to 1 and then 0% in the last two quartiles, with significant reduction of several of the major adverse events. We have recently presented and published a prospective non-randomized trial on fenestrate and brain channel grafts. And this was a trial that was adjudicated, monitored, and had imaging independently reviewed by a group of radiologists. 169 patients were enrolled, 21 await implantation, 148 underwent implantation, and we analyzed the data on the first 127 patients who had completed the minimum of 30-day follow-up. This included 47 pararenal, 42 extent 4, and 38 extent 1 to 3 thoracoabdominal aneurysms. The mortality on this prospective study was 0%, and the rate of major adverse event was 21% and was identical independent of the extent of the aneurysm. And importantly, the rate of paraplegia, one of the most feared and devastating complications of thoracoabdominal repair, was 2% for the entire cohort. Patient survival at one year was 96%, and it's evident that the mean follow-up is short, given that the study started in 2013. But there were no ruptures, aortic-related deaths, or conversions to open repair. Now, the first tip is that patient selection plays a critical role in the technical success and the outcomes. And one needs to learn how to say no to indicating this procedure. These are some examples of patients that, although the procedure may be even feasible, it certainly is not ideal and is fraught with higher technical failure and problems because of small, multiple renal arteries, early bifurcation of the renal arteries, excessive angulation, or a prohibitive amount of atherosclerotic debris within the thoracic aorta. Here is such an example of a patient that was referred to me for an endovascular thoracoabdominal repair. And if you appreciate that angulated arch and the amount of debris coupled with the tortuosity of the iliac limb, one can almost know for sure that this patient would be fraught with devastating complications of stroke and paraplegia, if not dialysis. So this patient was denied repair. The second tip is to appropriately select your landing zones, which should be placed in healthy aortic segments. Now, Roy Greenberg used to say when he was rounding with us that given an infinite lifespan, the whole aorta would become an aneurysm. And that is also true for patients that undergo fenestrated repair. If you note on this slide in 2005, the patient underwent a fenestrated repair and there was already some irregularity in the thoracic aorta. Over the years, the top stents start flaring and the device migrates do downwards, compromising patency of those side branches and associated with an endoleak that is nearly impossible to treat by endovascular means. So fenestrate and branch grafts are not immune to type 1 endoleak, and in fact, these patients may be even more prone to have progression of disease because they already show that the disease is more aggressive in their case by involving the renal and mesenteric arteries. This is a somewhat busy slide. I'll explain to you what it means. In the red line, you see that the number of two vessel repairs at the Cleveland Clinic has declined over the years, starting in 2004. Nearly every patient nowadays is treated with a four vessel repair. At the same period, in the dashed white line, 
you see that the number of endoleaks has significantly decreased. So we tend to select very healthy landing zones, usually above the CELIC axis. And one of the considerations is that the number of stations of intercoastal arteries that you're going to cover. Although, in this example, a minimum landing zone of 2.5 centimeters might be adequate, I chose to do a landing zone of 5 centimeters because we would not cover any additional intercoastal vessels. The third tip is to optimally design your stands. Here is an example of a fenestrated device with four fenestrations where you see a preloaded catheter and an axis scalloped in the top of the device and also the option of adding renal guide catheters. All these gadgets facilitate the procedure greatly if you choose to repair the aneurysm using a fenestrated design. You need to analyze the aorta in its entirety from the aortic valve all the way to the femoral arteries by performing center line of flow analysis as depicted on this slide and also looking at the axial views for the origin and angulation of the target vessels. One of the useful tools to analyze the aorta is the IVAR assist planning tool. You can see here the station and uh, you're locating the origin of the superior mesenteric artery which is now labeled. The next step after each vessel is located is the measurement between the center origin of each one of these vessels. Once the vessels are measuring length, the axial location is analyzed relative to the clock positions. Now on this particular case, which will be later presented in a video, you see the patient has a chronic dissection with a true and a false looming, and we are currently locating the clock position of the celiac, the SMA, the right renal artery, and the left renal artery. Also, this patient had two right-sided renal arteries. Following location of the clock positions, another important step on planning is measurement of the inner vessel diameter. That is critical for the design of the main body of the stent, the location of specific fenestrations in particular, but also for branches. You see here that the inner vessel diameter on this case takes in consideration only the true lumen where the main stent will be deployed. Once you obtain all the measurements, that is translated into a surgical plan and then an engineer plan. And if a patient-specific stent is manufactured, after a period of time, you have your design. In this example, with two branches and then two fenestrations for the right renal artery and a fenestration for the left renal artery. You can also add to your design this these preloaded catheters, which may greatly facilitate the procedure by allowing immediate access to the branches and the target vessels. If you note here, the device is not yet completely deployed. That allows you to have a lot of space to manipulate those catheters. And finally, you can also add preloaded guide wires or preloaded guide catheters into the fenestrations if that is approached from below, which may eliminate one of the steps of the procedure. It's also important that you consider the geometry of the aorta. You know, traditionally, I was taught to keep the fenestrated device very fat to just below the renal arteries and then taper the device, as exemplified in the left side of the slide. However, for example, if the patient has a narrow segment at the renal arteries, you may want to taper the device at that segment to avoid infolding of the stent. Here are some examples of designs. This patient was treated with two branches and two fenestrations, given the relatively narrow segment at the level of the renal arteries. Another example on the left of a patient with five vessels treated with a, primarily a fenestrated device. Here is an example of a patient with chronic dissection and a very compressed through looming, treated primarily with fenestrations. And then another example where the renal arteries and the SMA originated practically in the same location, and this was separated in the design by using branches for the mesentericus and fenestrations for the renal arteries. So you really adapt the stent to the anatomy of the patient rather than the anatomy to a particular stent. Now, 
lastly but not least, the T-branch endograft is an excellent choice as well, and you see here an example that is particularly suited to directional branches because of the very wide aortic diameter in this area. The fourth tip is to minimize contrast use. These are incredibly challenging procedures, and if you use the standard techniques of doing angiographies for every step of the case, you finish with large amount of contrast. Now, minimizing contrast can be done multiple ways. Diluting the contrast to 30 or 50 percent is always a good idea. You may precatheterize vessels. That's certainly how I started doing these procedures. That's not the way we do it nowadays. But you know, that may give you a lot of comfort to be precise in deployment of fenestrations. Currently, it's about imaging. An intraoperative fusion imaging and comb beam computer tomography and geography has greatly revolutionized the way we treat these patients. Minimizing radiation exposure is critically important, and I would like to talk about seven golden rules. You see here one of the first rules is to appropriately plan the procedure. And during the preoperative plan phase, to analyze each one of the target vessels with respect to the optimal projection so that you can uh, minimize radiation and already place the imaging intensifier in the adequate possession for displaying that particular vessel. The second rule is that you adequately protect yourself with lead apron, glasses, appropriate shields, not only for the legs, but the main body, and also ideally perform most of the steps of the procedure via the femoral approach and avoid using the transbrachial axis as much as you can. Unfortunately, for many of these torque abdominal cases, brachial or axillary axis is a critical step of the procedure. The third rule is that you should optimize your system geometry. You see here several combinations. The ideal scenario is to have the detector placed low, the table placed high. That way, you minimize scattered radiation and you minimize exposure to the patient at the entrance level uh, for radiation. Finally, these were videos that were gracefully shared by Stefan Hollon, and it highlights the importance of positioning of the II relative to the table and the use of InnovaSense, which can automatically adjust the position of the table to the, to the image's intensifier. You can see here the impact that this has in reducing radiation rates up to 25% in this study. The fourth rule is that you should use the lowest accept, acceptable dose rate as much as possible. That is usually 7.5 frames per second, as depicted here. Finally, using fusion, I think nowadays is critically important. It has eliminated the need to precatheterize the vessels like we used to do in the past. It allows you to minimize the use of contrast and also fluoroscopy. One of the first steps is to register the imaging using BiView so that the fusion is adequately combined with the bone landmarks here for you to locate the vessels. You see on this video, again shared by Stefan Hallon, the importance of preoperative sizing and planning, where he locates the, the origin of the internal iliac artery and can find the work position using uh, the GE system without need for fluoroscopy. I think this is truly one of the major benef benefits of the imaging unit in this particular scenario. Another example where he's fine-tuning the image by using uh, the mask to adjust the fusion. I tend to do this by precatheterizing one of the vessels. His preference is to do a small injection of contrast, as shown here, where he's now adjusting the fusion to the angiogram to make sure he adequately locates the origin of each one of the vessels. Finally, I think one of the greatest benefits of this imaging is the use of digital zoom. That allows you to work in a low magnific magnification field and at the same time zoom the image and use collimation to minimize radiation while keeping adequacy of the quality of imaging. 
we tend to avoid using digital subtraction and geography as much as possible. You can see here one digital subtraction is the equivalent of approximately 500 fluoro imagings. So we tend to use a lot of fluoro loops as depicted in this video, demonstrating a fluoro loop in the right renal artery. The exception is when you have a concern, a dissection, or an endoleak that you want to evaluate this more carefully, and then we do a digital subtraction. Finally, the last tip for radiation is to really avoid working as much as you can on the oblique or lateral views. Evidently, that may be needed, for example, to categorize an SMA or a celiac axis, but as soon as you can change to the AP view, that will greatly reduce radiation exposure. I could talk half an hour only about tips of how to bail out from these procedures, and I think the message is, particularly if you use fenestrations, which are less forgiving than branches, that there may be issues that need to be taken care of endovascularly, like misalignment of the stent or perforations in the vessels, etc. Here is an example of misalignment of the stent treated by inflating a balloon to create space so that you can catheterize the vessel. Now, it's remarkably useful to have, in this scenario, fusion imaging so you can locate the vessel without requiring repeated injections of contrast. The seventh tip is to use finesse on your endovascular techniques to avoid dissection, disruptions, perforations, kinks. Visualize your wire tip at all times. Avoid the use of excessively stiff wires on tiny branches, such as branches of the renal artery and to properly select to your wire in according to the angulation or the particular vessel. Also use small injections. The A tip is to avoid excessive prolonged lower extremity ischemia. What you see on this graph is the implication of introducing a large sheath via the femoral approach and occluding the profunda femoral artery and the internal iliac artery. We monitor the oxygenation in the leg and after approximately one hour, that decreased from 90% down to 30%, and the patient had changes in motor evoked potentials. And by retracting the sheath below the internal iliac artery, there was already recovery of the motor evoked potentials. Stefan Halon and his group published the importance of early reperfusion, which decreases mortality and spinal cord ischemia. Finally, total percutaneous approach is certainly a solution. You can also use the technique of Eric Verhoeven with a, a purse string in a femoral artery or a femoral artery conduit in selected cases that you anticipate difficulty. Another tip, particularly at the beginning of the experience, is to minimize blood loss. Certainly, I think at the beginning of the experience, with difficult cases, it might be useful to use cell saver to collect the blood in the drapes and administer to the patient. Finally, a critical step is the immediate assessment of these repairs. It's becoming very clear that conventional angiography is not sufficient to fully assess the complexity of these repairs. You see here an example of a non-contrast high-definition combing CT where we see the architecture of a T-branched endograft and the axial views. This is a patient treated just a few days ago for impending rupture symptomatic toric abdominal aneurysm. You can appreciate the angulation from a previous open surgical graft in the abdomen. That can be easily assessed at the completion of the procedure to make sure there is not a kink or a major endoleak, bend, or problem related to the side stands. Another ex two examples where combing CT is very instrumental when the stents are close to each other and you fear that there might be a kink, or in this case of a gore tambi retrograde stent where that side stent to the left side is subjected to significant angulation. And finally, with this particular stent, potential kink or compression of the retrograde branch is an issue, and that was adequately assessed using a combing CT with high definition and a 13-second spin. There is a number, an increasing number of publications demonstrating that combing CT can reliably detect endoleaks and technical defects with higher sensitivity than completion angiography and even a pre-dismissal CTA. 
and I think this technique will be instrumental to to decrease preventable early reinterventions from technical problems. Here are some examples where I run into problems that could be easily identified by having a cone beam CT scan. If a fenestrated graph is done, you need to assess that the bridging stent is adequately positioned, is not too far inside a vessel or too far outside, or is not compressed, as demonstrated in this slide. Compression can occur because when you place the ILEC limbs, the tip of the delivery system may squish the stent against the aortic wall. Here is an example of a patient treated with a fenestrate device where we did not perform a comb beam CT and we found early after the operation complete infolding of the ceiling stent. You can imagine that this is a difficult problem to treat. Fortunately, we were able to re-expand the stent and then a comb beam CT was performed and revealed full expansion of the stent graft. I would like to finalize demonstrating a case that exemplifies everything that I talked over the last 20 to 30 minutes. This is a five-vessel fenestrated endograft in a patient with a chronic dissection and torical abdominal aneurysm performed using the assistance of GE discovery imaging. The patient is a 78-year-old with an expanding extent to toric abdominal aneurysm. Vascular history was notable for acute type A dissection in 2012, treated with aortic valve replacement, ascending aortic repair. He had an EVAR at the outside institution with left hypogastric occlusion and was left with chronic dissection and a large endoleak in the infrarenal component. His cardiovascular risk factors in, are noted here. His evaluation consisted with laboratory tests, which showed a creatinine of 1.1, echocardiogram, which was normal, except for mild aortic regurgitation. His pulmonary function tests showed mild to moderate dysfunction, and the carotid ultrasound was widely patent with no evidence of extension. CT angiography depicts an extensive thoracoabdominal aortic dissection with a previous ascending aortic repair. As you can see in the proximal part, there is still involvement of the aortic arch by dissection and a small aneurysm. The dissection tracks across the renal mesenteric segment, the celiac axis, the SMA, two right-sided renal arteries, and a left-sided renal artery are involved by dissection. The CT angiography demonstrated here that the celiac axis originated from the true looming of dissection, so was the SMA the two right-sided renal arteries and a single left-sided renal artery, and there was a large endoleak into that infrarenal aortic aneurysm. The coronal views also demonstrate that there is fairly short distance between the renal arteries and the flow divider of that infrarenal aortic device. The size of the aneurysm was 7.5 centimeters in the abdomen and 7 centimeters in the proximal thoracic aorta, and you see here a summary of the location of the renal mesenteric vessels. This patient was approached uh, in a staged fashion with combination of vascular surgery and cardiac surgery. First, the aortic arch and aortic valve, which had regurgitation, were replaced by redo aortic valve replacement total arch using a frozen elephant run technique with placement of a CTAG device. The patient was then referred to me, and I performed a second-stage completion thoracic and vast repair by extending the repair to the celiac axis. We then planned a third-stage repair using combination of branches for the celiac and the SMA and fenestrations for the renal arteries. This is a novel design that applies a new delivery system. It is very difficult to see, but there are preloaded wires on each one of the branches and the fenestrations. We also order a small bifurcated inverted limb device to extend the repair to the old infrarenal stand. The procedure was done in the GE hybrid operating room with total percutaneous technique. Note here the, the approach after percutaneous approach is established, axis was established in the right femoral artery and in the left brachial axis, a wire was advanced to the thoracic aorta. Through the left femoral approach, we advanced a snare, and this portion of the video demonstrates snaring 
of the left brachial wire, establishing left brachial to femoral wire. Next, the fusion imaging is calibrated by selective catheterization of the left renal artery. Note here that the catheter is perfectly placed in the middle of that purple ring that locates the ostia of the left renal artery. Once the vessels are located, a 12 French flexor sheath was then introduced via the left brachial approach and positioned in the mid part of the thoracic aorta. The device was then oriented extracorporeally. Note here that the device has a very long delivery system. That delivery system is a 20 French sheath that leads to a 7 French sheath that will exit from the femoral approach through the left brachial approach. The sheath is now being introduced first with the smaller 7 French sheath, then leading to the 20 French sheath, all the way to the location of the target vessels. The sheath is now exit via the brachial approach as depicted in the top part of the video. That sheath has inside four preloaded wires. These wires allow immediate access to each one of the vessels. In this segment of the video, you see a sheath being advanced into the celiac branch and using the assistance of the fusion, a catheter is advanced to the celiac axis. This is confirmed with a limited angiography and a 0.14 wire is then advanced in position deep in the splenic artery. <clears throat> Next, the, the tension is directed to the superior mesenteric artery. Using digital zoom, you can see in collimation, limiting the radiation, the SMA is catheterized, followed now by catheterization of the left main renal artery. After a wire and catheter advanced to the left main renal artery, this is exchanged for a Rosen wire. And finally, the right lowest main renal artery is selectively catheterized. At this point, I elected to position a sheath and a stent ready to deploy in the right renal artery and elected to not catheterize the accessory small renal artery that was just above. <clears throat> the device was then fully deployed. The delivery system was removed and the landing zones were dilated using a compliable coda balloon. Next, the repair was extended distally into the old stand by using a small bifurcated device with an inverted limb. Note how important it is to have adequate imaging and precise location so that you don't crush the renal stents, which are not yet deployed at this stage. During this segment of the procedure, the gate is catheterized, the repair is extended, and then flow is restored to the lower extremities and the femoral arteries are closed. The entire remaining part of the procedure is now done from the brachial approach, with flow restored to the legs. First, the right renal stent is deployed. You see here it's being flared with a balloon. And note that this is a fluoral loop and not a digital angiography to limit the amount of radiation. Next, the left renal stent is then positioned. A puff angiography is performed. The stent is deployed and again flared using steps identical to the right side. After each one of these stents is deployed, the respective wire is then removed to allow more space within the 12 French brachial sheath. In this segment of the video, attention is then directed to the accessory branch, which was cannulated with a 0.14 wire and stented using a very small coronary stent. Note that this part of the aorta was sealed by the dissection. We then direct our attention to the SMA, which was stented, and finally, the celiac axis now is stented with a fluency stent. <clears throat> the patient also had a hepatic artery aneurysm, which I elected to leave untreated at this point. The repair was completed with diluted contrast with arch and thoracoabdominal aortography. We then perform a cone beam non-contrast CT of the renal mesenteric segment and observed that the seal extent was crushed by the, by the dissection and the median arc with ligament. We also noted some compression of the SMA stents. The remaining renal stents were adequately expanded without any technical problems. We then obtained access again from the left 
uh, approach and reinforce both the SMA stent depicted here followed by the silic stent. A comb beam CT was then repeated with significant improvement in the technical result. Again, this problem would not have been detected by only a completion in geography. This is the follow-up dismissal CT demonstrating adequate expansion of the stents with no evidence of attachment leak, but with a type 2 endoleak originating from a number of intercoastal arteries already there in the distal part of the thoracic aorta. I think this case exemplifies the complexity of fenestrated and branch endovascular repair in the current era with the available technology, and also the options to treat patients with difficult toracoabdominal aortic dissections in a staged fashion. This patient, this patient had total aortic repair, including the arch and the entire length of the toracoabdominal aorta. The patient progressed well, with a total hospital stay of six days, no neurological deficits, and a normal creatinine. So the 10 tips that I would say that I would like to highlight is patient selection, learn to say no, select your proper landing zone, don't compromise your repair, design wisely, use to your advantage catheters, tapers, guides, branches, combinations of fenestrated branches, Minimize contrast. Very importantly, minimize radiation exposure. Optimize your imaging and try to work on a dedicated hybrid room with fixed imaging. Know your bailout maneuvers. Conversion to open surgery is not an option on these complex cases. Use endovascular finesse. Avoid leg ischemia. Minimize blood loss. And assess your result immediately using combing CT. Thank you very much. I'll be open to questions now. What is your opinion on staged embolization of lumbar arteries prior to fenestrated stent? That's a technique that was championed by Chris Etz in Leipzig, and that is one strategy to promote collaterals to develop on toracoabdominal aneurysms. I am personally a little concerned with a catheterization of intercostal and lumbar arteries on these extensive aneurysms and the potential risk of embolization. My preferred staged approach is actually to cover the thoracic aorta first and then complete the repair. We do not use embolic protection for these cases in large part because we need to have stiffer systems that provide very good support to care stent grafts. I think we are a little limited on the availability of stent grafts, but uh, hopefully with industry interest, this is going to improve more and more. I would say I have uh, not used embolic protection on these cases. How long is going to be before universal use in the United States? I would say before commercial approval, I would guess still three to five years at the best. The one trial that's closer to start is the TAMBI trial in the United States, I think early next year. Cook Medical also has a toracoabdominal trial that uh, we are hopeful that will mature into a point that it can start within the next year. CT used for the fusion, do you have the patients by their side or arms up by the head? I tend to put the arm in the side, and I would highlight that with our imaging unit, we are able to transfer a very large monitor up and above the head so that we can image this comfortably. The one limitation of have the arm abducted to the side is that you really can't do a very good lateral projection but I tend to avoid lat lateral projections anyway because of the excessive radiation. Do you use self-expanding covert stents? It depends. Uh, if 
Traditionally, if you use fenestrations, that is a balloon expandable covert stent. If you use branches, that is a self expandable covert stent. The new balloon expandable via band stent, I think it will revolutionize this because it's very flexible and you'll be able to use uh, for branches as well. How long each stage of the operation takes? Well, the first stage, the TVAR, it takes, I guess, an hour and a half for anesthesia to get ready and 30 minutes to put the thoracic stent, unless you need to do a cervical debranching. The thoracoabdominal repair averages anywhere between two up to four hours. We rarely nowadays have a case that lasts beyond four hours. Average is about three hours or so for a four vessel. The average uh, duration of the case, again, for fenestrated, for four vessel, two and a half hours. I think one important improvement has been on the area of radiation. Traditionally, before we had this novel imaging unit, uh, a case would take three gray, two to four gray. Nowadays, average is about 500 milligray, almost universally less than one gray, even for the most complex cases. This case that I showed you was 1.5 gray, and it was with the two combing CTs performed. Which software uh, we perform for planning? I'm very comfortable historically with the Terra Recon, which we had for many years. We are moving more and more to using the AW and the EVAR assist planning tool. One of the, the, the advantages is that it allows you to save your plan and your projections, which can be immediately transferred to the hybrid room so that it cuts some of the work that is done during, during the day of the case. For a program doing EVAR, TVAR, REVAR, some standard ZFAN dissection, what are the next steps towards more complex cases? Well, I think that uh, there are several centers dedicated to this. I noticed some joined the conference here. Most would agree that the areas of more developed nowadays are arch and, and the complex dissections, you know. Having said that, we still have to get these devices widely available, even for the, the thoracoabdominal aneurysm. What is your preferred branch or bridging stent? So for the fenestrations, our experience has been with the iCast by Maquette. And for the branches, my preference is really the Viaband for the renal arteries. Quite frankly, I would prefer to use also the Viaband for the mesenterics, but on the larger diameters, the sheath is very large, and therefore we have used a fair amount of fluency stent grafts for the silica and the SMA. What's your, I think I answered the embolization. And uh, what is your opinion about staged embolization? I answered that one, uh, that's an option. I think there is very preliminary work, but I prefer to do a TVAR followed by completion repair. Do you know the snare ride maneuver? I, I don't know that I understood the question. Uh, uh, there is a, a number of maneuvers for bailout which I did not present today uh, because it really detracted from from, from the entire topic, but I don't know this maneuver that was asked. Do you find the utility of IVUS? Well, we did IVUS on this case. They had a chronic dissection, and I know some investigators like to do it to locate the vessels. Carlos Timaran is very fond of IVUS. <clears throat> Quite frankly, it's not something that I found super useful, and I, I have to tell you with the fusion image we have nowadays, it's tough to ask for better than that. I mean, once you locate one of the vessels and it's calibrated, you can locate every one of, of the vessels. Uh, well, so this is a, a dedicated vascular surgery team. Uh, I have fellows on my service. I have residents on my service. But most importantly, we have a very dedicated team of nursing staff, technologists, which have assisted me from the beginning of the experience. 
And I think for anyone doing these cases, if you can if you can build a team with all aspects from the anesthesia, critical care, nursing, post-operative care, that is really critical to improve your results. Is there any idea to leave one branch uh, open to decrease paraplegia? So this is a concept called Temporary Aneurysm Sac Perfusion, TASP. Uh, and, and the answer is I didn't show today, but I, I we monitor motor evoke potentials, and we have a specific protocol, and that protocol tells us that if we don't normalize the potentials, we have to leave one of the branches open, and that's usually the celiac branch or uh, the contralateral limb of the gate. That is rare. I mean, it's very clear nowadays that immediate paraplegia is becoming more and more rare if the procedure goes well. I don't like the, st the strategy of having these branches open all the time because you'll see patients with disseminated intravascular coagulopathy after the operation, and occlusion of these branches could be a challenge if you need to put a spinal drain on it. Do you realign systemically stents with bare metal stents? The answer is I used to, and I don't do it anymore because you get intimal hyperplasia in the bare metal stents. I don't think you need to do it every time. I think you need to do it if there is a kink. The important messages we got here is planning, take your time, spend time, second image. It's why the word finish with image. I agree. Uh, do you always do kissing balloon special batch? I don't always do kissing balloon. If I think one of the stents might be compressed, then we would contemplate doing a kissing balloon. There are very few things that I would say I always do. Uh, I do think, uh, ideally, you need to access the re to immediately evaluate your result with a Combin CT, if that's available. Now, I mean, these aneurysms on the studies I presented were classified based on the CT and not on the extent of repair. For example, sometimes you may have a pararenal aneurysm that is repaired as an extent for thoracoabdominal aneurysm. For the purpose of the studies that we do here and the data is presented, we classify this as a pararenal aneurysm. Okay, that was the question by Dr. There is debate on that. I think I answer about perfusion branch. I'll tell you why I prefer to stage with a TVAR first for several reasons. One is that you cover the thoracic aorta. You already decreased your second stage significantly. Uh, you may promote thrombus in the thoracic aorta in the first stage, which may reduce systemic inflammation in the second stage. You don't have to deal as much with the DIC that can happen with perfused branches. So I, I tend not to do that. What's the minimum technology for a successful? Well, I can tell you we, I've done these cases with C-arm, and I know many investigators that do it with a C-arm. So it's technically possible to do, but the image is not going to be as good. You're going to miss some problems. You're going to radiate yourself, radiate yourself a lot and the patients. And certainly, if you're doing this on a consistent basis, I think you need to have a hybrid room with the capacity of fusion and with the capacity of doing a combing CT at the end. Here they're asking if you're positioning the patient's arms are on the side when you're doing the radiation, it's more radiation to the body. No, I don't put the arms on the side. I abduct the arms. Left arm is abducted, the right one is stuck. And I rarely use a lateral view. When is, your book when is my book coming? The book is going to be uh, very like uh, we finished the proofs. I would think that by January it's going to be printed and available. I perclose whenever I can. Currently, over 80% are done percutaneously. Yes, I do T-branch uh, outside of emergency indications. I think T-branch is, is an excellent choice if you can 
if you can fit uh, on the anatomy. Uh, I am a little concerned about the patency of the renal branches as compared to fenestration, so I tend to use a lot of renal fenestrations. But uh, as a, exemplifying on that case, there was a T-branch and there are also elective cases we use T-branch. When do you perform another one branch? Let me see if I understood the question. Ah, okay, if I leave a branch open, I'll tell you, I had two cases in the last two years, and that's it. Uh, one I, I completed in three days, and the other one I completed in four weeks. But I completed in four weeks because he had pancreatitis and we needed to recover. Both of them did fine. Uh, I would wait ideally a minimum of five days, if you can. Do you agree with liberal use of ELEC branch device? I absolutely agree. I think for thoracoabdominal aneurysms, it's kind of criminal to occlude an internal ELEC artery. You would significantly increase the rate of paraplegia on that patient. Are there some cases where you avoid percutaneous axis? Oh, yes. I would say if the patient has significant calcifications in the femoral artery or a high bifurcation, I would not do a percutaneous approach. I would prefer to uh, to to do a cut down. Uh, if you think the axis is healthy, I do percutaneous. But after you close the suture, leave your wire for at least five or ten minutes. Don't take it out. Make sure that your patient doesn't doesn't have any high potential. We have not had any event of uncontrolled hemorrhage on our series. Last question. Last question. What is the minimum year load for fenestrate branch cases to start these techniques? Well, to start these techniques, you want to start with ELEC branches and ideally with simpler designs. You, you saw on every one experience, most people start with two vessels and they go forward. Ideally, if you want to build a program, I think you have to be doing you know, I would be guessing because I don't know anyone has know the answer, but 15, 20 cases a year is the minimum that I would recommend. Earlier asked. I have never had, I mean, injury to the brachial artery. Guillermo is asking, we do an ultrasound before we puncture. We make sure the artery is larger than 4 millimeters. If it is smaller, we go to the axillary artery, the deltopectoral groove or infraclavicular. At the end, we have to absolutely make sure the artery has no dissection. About 5% of the case, we have to do a little patch to fix. And Dr. Benitez from Spain asked, what do you think about Viaben for branches? I really like Viaben. I wish I could use on every branch, but the larger ones are very large sheath, and sometimes I use fluency for that. But I think the Viaben, uh, it takes curves very well and is a great choice. Yeah. Do you use self expanded cover stance? I think I answered that one. Yes. Comment? I think we're good. What is your I think uh, well, I, uh, that Ryan Goff has asked us, why is my preferred Bridging stand for branches, Ryan, is the via band. But, you know, the via band on, on 10 millimeters, it comes through an 11 French sheath. So then I prefer to use a fluency. And also the, the lengths, you know. We need stands that are like 7.5, 8 centimeters in length for this if you're going to use branches. Last uh, question. Upward branch. Well, let me answer that by saying that I have used in one case over the last 10 years. So I prefer to go with a downward branch, but uh, if the anatomy is unfavorable for a downward branch and you really don't want to use a fenestration, then you go with an upward branch. What cover stent I use? Well, I use the iCast, MyCat, or V12 for the fenestrations. I use Viaben for the renal branches. I use either Viaben or Fluency for the mesenteric branches.
Well, I would like to thank everybody for joining, and uh, we will be ending the conference now. It was a pleasure to help with this today. Bye.